Good warm morning. Happy Sabbath. Delighted that you are with us as we commence another month. Here we are, uh, July. July is in full swing, and we are delighted that you have decided to join us again as we continue the second in our series of lessons on Mark. Last week, we talked about this idea of Mark as the storyteller, and today we're going to focus on the protagonist in Mark's story, which is obviously Jesus. So we're going to look at what a day, at least according to Mark, is in the life of Jesus. But uh, I would venture to say that uh, we're going to end uh, after these 50 minutes pretty exhausted. So we're going to jump right into it. Before we do that, we're going to pray. Uh, join me, won't you? Jesus, thank you for being who you are. Mm. What can we say except seasons come and go, years pass, uh, we change, and yet you remain there, ever-present, ever-faithful. So thank you for that assurance, and as we discuss, we simply ask that you abide with us. Amen. Amen. So we have Joey back uh, for a little bit, and like I said, this summer we're all going to be kind of coming and going. Um, but today we've got we've got my good friend Joey O. Ah, it's nice to be back. Yeah, <laughs> even though it's a little hot here in Loma Linda, <laughs> it's Just nice to be bit. back. Yeah. Oh, uh, it was it was great to see Zach on mm -hmm. um, the Sabbath School, um, coming from the other side of the camera mm -hmm. to this side of the camera. You guys had a great discussion to open up this. Yeah, this he did a great job. He did a great. We're going to all be out of a job because he did such a great job just <clears throat> framing. I think it was a really good way to frame mm -hmm. uh, our conversation as the gospel. Because like we talked last week, the gospel writers are storytellers mm -hmm. and they're trying to tell tell a story. And mm -hmm. so looking at it from that vantage point, I think, opens up a whole new panorama uh, as we start to kind of delve deeper and, and sink our teeth into Mark. Yeah, that's that's really powerful because sometimes we just look for, okay, so what are what is true? What is mm -hmm. what is real? What actually happened? Mm -hmm. And we, we focus on those things. Of course the gospels happen, but um understanding that the writers had a mm -hmm. vision for what they're mm -hmm. the story they're trying to tell is a very powerful way of looking yeah, at the gospels. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. There's a difference and this might be a perfect segue into kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, early 20th century, uh, there kind of was in the academia a move to try to find the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, all sorts of things uh, began to develop out of particularly the study of Jesus and the Gospels. Uh, even in our Adventist campuses, uh, some some new classes were created, Jesus and the Gospels. Uh, in other schools, it's called uh, Life and Teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was all kind of uh, brought up by this this new approach to looking at the Gospels more holistically. Um, that was followed, I think, by this new focus on trying to find the historical Jesus. Mm. And while I think that uh, it's very important to match Jesus with the life and the culture and the, geograph the geographical location in which he lived, we sacrifice a little bit of the story uh, that that the gospel writers are trying to to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, today, as we look at quote unquote a day in Jesus's ministry, to ask ourselves if this actually happened throughout the process of a twenty four hour continuous day, I think is to miss the 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 real question. The question is. Who is Mark trying to depict? Mm. Uh, what is Mark trying to tell us about Jesus? So I'm interested in in seeing how how it, this lesson grasped and grabbed you as um, you kind of perused through it. Yeah, I mean, I 
I love what you're saying here that um, the reason why Mark wrote it this way was to make a point, mm -hmm. right? In that there is so much that happens in the course. I mean, it is it is a little longer than day, the day one day because he calls the disciples and then they, they move into the Sabbath. But, but there's... I mean, talk about a full Sabbath. I thought I had a full Sabbath. Yeah. Jesus had a very full Sabbath. I mean, preaching, casting out demons, healing people. I mean, the whole gamut that he does here in, in his Sabbath day. And and yet there, there seems to be a reason why Mark wants wants his readers to get this. And I love I love how the um the lesson focused on that, how different gospels open Jesus's ministry in different mm -hmm. ways. But Mark's it seems like there's a sense of fullness, urgency, power, action. Like Jesus, Jesus is almost, he almost focuses on people's reaction to Jesus more than just what Jesus mm -hmm. does. Like he wants people to understand this is no other, no ordinary man that we're encountering here. I think that's the first part. And I think that that link with the extraordinary character that is Jesus within mm -hmm. the Gospel of Mark has to be linked with the power of the message. Mm. So the message, I think, throughout Mark is every bit as a as much a protagonist as the messenger. Mm. Uh, it is impossible to separate Jesus from the message of Jesus. And you see that start to pop up mm. uh, within with very early on in, in Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned two words, I think, that that are really important to consider as we as we began to kind of round uh, off the picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus is trying to accomplish throughout uh, the Gospel of Mark, and that is urgency uh, and action. Mm. You see kind of these, these snippets. It's almost like you have, uh, you cut in, Mark cuts in, you have this block, you have a scene, and then there's really no transition time, which is really odd. It's, it's almost kind of jarring because... Yeah. Most times, and in other Gospels, think about the Gospel of John, for example, you have kind of this slow buildup with a lot of discourse. Jesus, uh, Luke does a great job of placing Jesus um, in social settings where he's teaching. Matthew uh, has these long discourses as well, um, but connected to Scripture vis-a-vis -vis who Jesus is, mm -hmm. and Jesus kind of having this conversation, not in a social circle, in in like in Luke, or um, in a quote-unquote miracle worker uh, symbolism, like in John, but rather Jesus is having these conversations with with uh, the Old Testament. Here in Mark, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. You don't have any type of kind of build up or segue. It's just one action after the other action after the other action. And so I think it, it's a very appealing um, gospel for people that are that are harried and hurried. Mm. Um, and I I, uh, I understand why early, early uh, interpreters of Mark uh, connected Mark uh, as the gospel to, to Rome, uh, mm. because it seems like in a place uh, that is full of activity, uh, this Jesus that is constantly on the move uh, would have been would have been very much accepted and understood by people living uh, in cosmopolitan areas like Rome. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting way of putting that. That the Gospel of Mark, because Jesus is immediately constantly mm -hmm. moving, that that it would have appealed to those who are also hurried. And yet, what's what's interesting is right in the middle of this this day this this passage, you have Jesus withdrawing from the crowds, mm -hmm. and that becomes a, a, a focal point that the disciples get very disturbed about, and they get bothered about, it, almost reprimand Jesus from mm -hmm. for not doing more and healing more people because their focus is on what can Je how many people can Jesus heal, and how can we grow his popularity, and Jesus. Jesus basically says, "This is that's not the work I came here to do." Yeah, and even even in that uh, that shift, I think uh, where Jesus kind of rises early and disappears uh, mm -hmm. to find some quiet, there is a harriedness in the pace. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not kind of these these long introspective uh, settings yeah. that other gospels 
uh, start to start to project. I'm thinking about Luke that does a, just a masterful job of kind of creating these these long rhythms where this the time that Jesus spends alone is almost equal. And if you're looking at at how many verses he dedicates to that, mm-hmm. is almost at, equal to the time he actually spends ministry. Here in Mark, even Jesus is stepping away has uh it, it has a sense of urgency mm-hmm. um because the disciples are are kind of pressing in on Jesus saying hey look everyone's looking for you yeah. what do we do and mark concludes this whole section and i think this is why uh the message is uh is so key uh if you're looking at who the protagonist of the story because by the time that uh, Jesus ends his uh, this day and a half, or two days um, of actual ministry that Mark starts to to depict here very early on in his book, it says that Jesus is is completely completely flooded. Mm-hmm. There are people from every corner mm-hmm. of Galilee that have now come to the point now that Jesus's ministry for the rest of the book will be. Um, will be occurring on the countryside and outside of the cities just because of the crush of the people. Mm. Uh, so in a very short time, uh, this message kind of, it, it spreads like like wildfire, fire, which is very different than, again, other gospels that mm. kind of have this slower buildup. Yeah, it's true. It starts with a bang. Mm-hmm. His story starts with a bang. I also want to go back to what you said about how Mark... Um, the message is just as important as the messenger. Um, Again, that, that seems like um, it seems like it contradicts what's happening here because there's so much action. Right. And yet I I think I I agree with you in that because even though the message is so short compared to the other gospels, right. Mm -hmm. Where Jesus is preaching for chapters here it, it right before he calls the disciples, it says, this is the message of Jesus. The time has come. Verse 15 the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mm-hmm. Right, that, That's it. That's the message. And then he calls the disciples with a short message. Come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And yet those two messages become the framework for what Jesus mm-hmm. does the rest of the time. It's almost like the illustration of the message is what Jesus is how Jesus mm-hmm. lives his life throughout those. So the, it, it's as if Mark is communicating this is not just a message that you just hear and think this is a good idea. Mm. It is something that changes the way that you live. Mm. And Jesus lived out his message, mm. which is why, like you said, there's this, uh, you can't untangle the message from the messenger. Yeah. And it's, it, it all, I think, stems uh, from, from what you mentioned in verse 15. Uh, the kingdom of God is near, mm. um, and that I think is a is a mistranslation. Mm. Um, and we can talk a little bit, maybe if we have time, about what uh, the original language says. But for Mark, uh, there is a, just like there is an immediacy to what Jesus is doing, there is an immediacy to the kingdom. And so it's almost like Mark is saying, "Okay, we are living in a messianic age now, and this is how." Uh, that reality is changing uh, both principalities and powers on earth and in and above earth and beyond and, and under the earth. And it's really interesting because that point that you're that you're making about kind of these illustrations of what the message is are not seen by um, the people or are not understood by Mark's audience or the people that Mark's interacting with as mere actions. Mm -hmm. They are understood as the message. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Jesus walks into a synagogue um, and he starts, it says simply that the people were amazed at his teaching. And then you have kind of Jesus's first encounter with a demon possessed man. Jesus frees the man. And then uh, the people in verse 22 say a new, a new teaching and with authority. Mm-hmm. It's not a new teacher, uh, which is really, which is really, really interesting and mm-hmm. nuanced. Uh, what is actually being uh, confronted is kind of this, it, it's a new teaching. Yeah. Um, Mark doesn't really, because most scholars will tell you 
It is uh, the first gospel ever written. His Christology isn't fully developed. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to have a gospel with a high Christology, I, I think you start with John. But what Mark does, uh, I think, better than any other gospel is Mark grounds the message of the gospel in kind of the earth, uh, the earthiness of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And he says the message is the messenger. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have people not quite, even I, I would actually venture to say, even Mark doesn't fully understand all the implications of who Jesus is. Um, but he understands that this message has indeed heralded a new age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for Mark, words are not just words. They're not just, um, it's not just a message. It's a message that has action. And you see that in, in like you pointed out, that the response that these uh, these listeners to Jesus have in that they're saying, Jesus when Jesus speaks, things happen, and things happen when Jesus speaks, right? Like his actions are his message, and his message are his actions. Mm -hmm. So that is so, and and that's the contrast that they set up between Jesus and the other the other teachers, in that Jesus Jesus's words actually have authority and power mm -hmm. to create change mm -hmm. when Jesus and. I, I love this. I, I, I think it was William Lane who, who talked about how Jesus, when he speaks here, he doesn't just speak like, he doesn't use formulas or incant incantations or, or other symbolic actions to try to coax out the demon. Jesus says, be silent, and the demon mm -hmm. is silent. Jesus says, come out, and the demon comes out. So he, he's pointing out Jesus's words have such power that um, other people didn't. And it, it makes me wonder, because this is all framed in the context of Jesus calling his disciples to follow him, mm -hmm. to become like him, to to be to to do as he did. So my question is: Is Jesus showing the disciples what he wants them to do in the future? There's there's definitely there's definitely that, um, and I think for. For a fuller answer, we'll, we'll simply have to revert to um, our conversation last week, which dealt with Mark 16 and the postscript. Uh, we said last week, if you if you watch, that uh, both Zach and I really love the way that the earliest manuscripts of uh, Mark end the story, mm. kind of uh, amazement, uh, fear, uh, and uh, in there's this kind of in the midst of a very decisive gospel there's the indecisiveness of the ones who are called to follow Jesus mm. because for mark really uh the the reading is to have a transformative effect not in the not in the people that he is writing about mm. but rather in the people who are actually hearing uh the story of the gospel for the first time so i think one of the things that that he does uh, really, really well as you speak about power and what he's trying to get. Not only his disciples, I, I would I would push that further and say it's the people who are reading the book who now have to say, okay, what do we do in light of the reality of the empty tomb? Yeah. Uh, we might because far as we know, those women might still be waiting at the entrance of the tomb without sharing the message of the risen Jesus to anyone. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Um, and I think that's what you see with the disciples. You have Jesus kind of inviting the reader to say, okay, what does it mean to you that we are living in the reality of the kingdom of heaven at hand? Mm -hmm. What does it mean that you have a person who has called you to fish for people? Even if you don't quite understand what that, the implications of that. And I think that's what I love about this gospel, that the implications aren't flushed out. Mm -hmm. um, it says time and time again in Mark chapter one, uh, the demons know who Jesus, but who Jesus was. But it seems like that's the only group that actually knows who Jesus is. Even the readers don't understand, I think, fully who Jesus is, because Mark doesn't uh, 
uh, disclose that openly. He simply, he, Jesus throughout the gospel is referred to as the Holy One, the Holy One of God, the sent one from God. Like we said, his Christology is not fully fleshed out. But even in spite of that, uh, you are invited not only to go and preach a message that you might not fully understand with implications that you might fully not grasp, mm. and you're invited to do things that might not fully make sense. Mm. And so, yes, I think Mark presents Jesus not only as kind of, uh, in the other Gospels, you have Jesus as kind of the paragon of God in flesh. Mm -hmm. Think about John. In Mark, Jesus is much more of an example to follow mm -hmm. than this paragon of divinity. Mm -hmm. And I think you need both, obviously. But uh, Mark does ground uh, Jesus in, in, again, everyday fleshy existence that you and I are called to live in. And so it's an invitation to simply go and follow even when you don't understand all the implications of that. Yeah, I love how you describe that, that undergirding all of the chapters of Mark is this invitation or this question of what will you do, mm -hmm. right? In the context of everything that you know that, that Jesus has done and of the message and the, the messenger of Jesus what will you do? How will you respond? So the question when when we read the call of the first disciples who, without any context, uh, and I, I appreciated how the author of um, author of uh, of uh, the uh, lesson study talked about this, that you know in in the book of John we're giving some context, right? right? That that the, these disciples actually heard about Jesus from John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. In Mark, he doesn't give that context. He he actually just says, Jesus walks up to these random fishermen and says, come follow me. And they drop everything and follow him, right? They leave everything behind. They leave their livelihoods behind. And later we find out that Peter even has a family. He has a home. He has people to take care of. And he's going to follow this itinerant rabbi with no um, source of income and just going to leave everything behind to follow him. It seems... At face value, it seems irresponsible. Mm. Now, of course, we understand if you understand the context and th what it means to become a rabbi and how all Jewish boys wanted, that was their dream to become a rabbi, you sort of understand this call and why they, they did this. And yet it almost seems like Mark is trying to set it up to be shocking, to say, man, Jesus came and called and they were willing to drop everything to follow him. What are you willing to do mm. when Jesus calls? And there is, I think there is that really interesting interplay because as you're mentioning, uh, the call of Jesus is radical on two fronts. It's radical because it comes unexpectedly, mm. but it's also radical because it represents the democratization mm. of education. Yeah. Um, in order to be called, you want to call fishermen to mm. follow you if you were a rabbi. If yeah. you were a rabbi, you wanted the bright, the best and the brightest. So if you were an actual rabbi, you would go to Jerusalem and select from people that were at, that were being trained uh, people to follow you. Yeah. Uh, here, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus goes to the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he picks mm. the people to follow him. And so that invitation, I think, is incredible in, in it in the sense that it does represent that this this idea that the apex of of, of education the most prestigious prestigious position that you could have mm. in in the jewish world is now open to everyone yes. in jesus uh but there it, it is unexpected it it comes and i think that's what's shocking it comes in it it doesn't come as you have your nose buried in the Torah. It comes as you're engaged in the most quotidian task of them all, which is your your fishing. You're doing what you've done probably since you had the capacity yeah. to, to walk. And so I think in that sense, yeah. Mark is saying this book is going to grab you, uh, whether you are uh, whether you are doing uh, what you've always done in the midst of your routine, mm. this message is going to grab you and your life is not is never going to be the same. The second piece I think is that's that's really fascinating is how Jesus frames that invitation, mm. right? Because as you mentioned, for a rabbi, for the student of a rabbi, 
the idea is you you are now selected to follow your rabbi mm -hmm. and eventually you will become a rabbi yourself and have followers mm -hmm. um every rabbi would then invite uh his followers to say come follow me and become like me mm -hmm. that's not what jesus says mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus says, come follow me, and I am going to make you fish for people. Yes. And so there's kind of this really interesting combination. Um, it's almost as if Jesus is saying every single thing that you've done from the very beginning of your life uh, has prepared you for this moment. Mm. And uh, it, it it's, it's fun that how Jesus, or how Mark at least, attempts to link up uh, our everyday experiences mm. as preparation for uh, this mission that we, quite frankly, still don't fully grasp. Yeah, I love that, that there are no wasted experiences with Jesus. Jesus is going to take um, all the things that we thought were just side roads and side tracks and detours, and those things will become what Jesus uses to help us do the ministry that he has mm. called us to. And I I love that that focus that you you said that that it's not just a call to follow him to become like him that's part of it but it's also a call to become fishers of men. So this is not just for the sake of me that I'm following you. It's the sake of others mm -hmm. that I'm following you, mm -hmm. right? So there is that very intentional duality from the very beginning. You follow to become like me, but you also follow so that when you become like me, you can be fishers of men. Yeah. Like you can go out and fish. Yeah. And that 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 imagery of fishing that he uses to say, you know what? I, I love how you put it, the democratization of education. Um, when you said that, it made me think like, what would this be like in our day and age? Mm. Um, it would be like Harvard Medi Medical School recruiting from, not from the elite universities uh, of college students, but from like blue collar workers in a factory and mm -hmm. walking up and saying, do you want to, do you want to enter into medical school? All expenses paid. Th that, that's what this would be. It would be like the, the Lakers not drafting from the elite college players, but just walking to a street court and pulling off random people who are playing street ball and saying, do you want to play for the mm -hmm. Lakers? Right. It's, it's, shocking like you said it evens the floor and it it doesn't make sense and yet this is what jesus does mm -hmm. and this is the call that jesus extends to us saying no matter where you are or what you've done or what where what in your phase of journey you are what you've gone through is not wasted i'm going to call you to follow me if you will follow me i will use all of that to do to make you fishers of men yeah and um, for them, it's fishers of men. For Jesus, it might be something else. Mm. Um, for those who are uh, engaged in another profession, um, it will uh, think about Levi Matthew, and the call probably wasn't, hey, I'm going to make you a fisher of, yeah. of men. It's going to be, hey, I'll teach you how to balance the scales with grace. <laughs> or whatever. It, what, you, yes. It's basically uh, this idea that life experience, there is no, this is what's so radical, because 2,000 years later, we still struggle um, in the sense that we create these very clearly defined lines, right, between uh, the academia and, uh, and religious practice in, in our, our particular professions, or mm -hmm. uh, church and my everyday life. Or uh, my work as a nurse or a physician or uh, an electrician and my spiritual life. There, we tend to compartmentalize really well um, because that's kind of how Western culture has trained us to mm -hmm. think. In Jesus, Jesus is saying, your being out, your hands uh calloused uh, and salt in your hair um, and sun-kissed as you are, mm -hmm. every single 
evening that you went out and pushed your boat on to the to the sea that was preparation uh that was every bit as valuable mm. as studying under Gamaliel in Jerusalem mm. and that's i think what's really fascinating particularly in a western culture where we do have these very clearly defined kind of roles that we play and we have obviously some professions that are more well respected than others and what jesus is telling these uh blue collar workers who who are live who are breathing and living as subsistence subsistence, subsistence fishermen mm. hey every night you were out there it was training for mm. what is to come yeah actually you saying that reminds me of a song that i used to sing in in um, high school, elementary, uh, give me oil in my lamp. Did mm -hmm. you guys sing that? But there were these verses, uh, give me wax for my board, keep me surfing for the Lord, yeah. or give me gas for my Ford, keep me trucking. For... So all of these things, these are different ways that God, God can take whatever our skill set, whatever our experience is, and God can take it and use it mm. um, to further his kingdom. Mm. And that's a, such a beautiful message. Mm. And yet, I, I think when it comes to the way that Mark is constructing this, this narrative, you have these people who have understood uh, or who at least have decided to step out into faith. But then you have also kind of this, this experience that, yes, the kingdom is, is at hand, and yes, every single activity uh, that you have engaged in before uh, you have found your vocation um, is important uh, as part of your spiritual development, spiritual growth. But you still, you still have kind of the reality that the world is broken. Mm. And so it's so fascinating that in chapter one, most of Jesus's time after he calls all of Jesus's time, I, we should say, after he calls these disciples, is spent alleviating suffering. Mm. Yeah. And I, it's, so I, I want to, I want to comment on that. I just want to go back for a second to what, what Jesus does here when he calls his disciples. He calls them, and it's this amazing thing where he is going to take all of their talents and skills and experiences like you so beautifully described and use them but it does take a sacrifice from them right mm -hmm. they have to leave something behind they have to say no to something to say yes to jesus right but when they do they experience something that's very rare and seems unusual to to the world around them in that like you're talking about jesus walks out and he starts bringing healing wherever he goes and it's almost, at least for, I, I, I'd love to get your take on it, but as I was reading through this passage, it's almost as if these things that Jesus does is just an outflow of who he is, mm -hmm. right? It's not like, it's not like he, ha he has this effort of, you know, working really hard to heal these. It's, it's almost as, it's almost described as if Jesus, I don't want to compare Jesus to Forrest Gump. But almost as in, Jesus, like he walks into a room and amazing things happen, right? Like he brings amazing healing things around him. He, he interacts. It's like the healing comes out of him. Mm -hmm. And I love how you tied those two things together. The message and the messenger are are linked. They can't be separated, right? You can't you can't remove one from from the other. And so this, it's it's like. It's like Jesus is a presence of healing that as he moves through this world, he brings to this world what it should be. Mm. Because as you described, the world is broken. And I, I love, you know, we've been reading John Mark Comer's book um, uh, during our uh, staff worships at our, at our mm -hmm. church. And I love how in one of his chapters, he describes how um, we look at the brokenness of this world and we think that that's what's natural. Mm. That's the way things should be. But 
when we encounter Jesus, we realize that everything we see in this world, all the sickness, disease, death, that's what's unnatural. Mm -hmm. What's natural are the the miraculous Mm -hmm. healing that happens in the presence of Jesus. That's what's real and natural, and that's what should be. And we get a glimpse of that as Jesus moves into this world that around him, almost almost without him trying, things become as they should be, at least for a moment, yeah. at least temporarily, right? And that's that's the beauty of what I see here. It's like Jesus, that, that just flows out of him and miraculous things happen. And the, the miracles have to do not just with the life of the people who are being delivered. The miracles have to do, because I think, so I think we see, and this is, I think, where, where Jesus is different. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research that has been done about demon possession, for example, mm-hmm. which is the primary thing that Jesus deals with here. And uh, we kind of understand that uh, a lot of what would be attributed to demon possession in the ancient Near East are all kinds of mental health maladies, for which, thankfully, uh, God has inspired uh, physicians to create medications that can better treat that. So what's the difference between Jesus and a really skilled physician? Hmm. And the difference is that Jesus isn't just transforming personal persons. Jesus is transforming places. And think about kind of the environment and what the environment looks like after Jesus has moved. So first you have these two uh, two sets of brothers, right? You have you have Peter and Andrew. You have uh, John and James. Those aren't they're not equal. There's been a lot. There's been quite a bit of a research done about this kind of almost feud that existed between uh, the, particularly Peter and, and John in, in the Gospels. Um, and that's because P- John and James come from a very different family mm. than Peter and Andrew. Peter and Andrew are your rough and tumble, uh, bottom of the barrel kind of uncouth fishermen. Uh, they're what we would call subsistence level fishermen. If they don't fish, you don't eat. Mm. John and James, on the other hand, uh, they're a bit they're a bit more sophisticated. Mm. Um, they have boats. They have uh, it's dad's business. Uh, there's other people working for them. There's subsistence farm uh, fishermen working for them. Chances are, at some point. Uh, Peter and Andrew might have worked uh, for James and John's family. And so you have kind of this, even in the fishermen that Jesus is calling, you have kind of this disparity. Mm -hmm. And that disparity disappears, uh, not just with Jesus. uh, With Jesus' presence, it's almost like he's saying subsistence level workers and people who have family businesses, now we're we're, we're on equal ground. And then he go, he steps into a synagogue, and I don't know if you've ever wondered what on earth is a demon possessed man doing inside a synagogue. Yeah. Well, Mark is very clear. Mark is saying, look, religious spaces, important as they might be, just like uh, economic spaces and, and the marketplace that is business, just as good as they can be without Jesus, there are these inequalities that are po- that are going to pop up, mm. and there are going to be uh, problems, deep-seated problems that happen within the church. But after Jesus enters that space, much in the same way that after Jesus enters kind of the marketplace, uh, that space is transformed. Mm. So I think what, what makes Jesus different from a really skilled leader or a really skilled physician, or a really skilled public speaker, is that Jesus is not not just about the transformation of people. He's about the the transformation and the reinvigoration of the whole places and whole systems. Mm. Wow. So as Jesus walks in, he doesn't just heal individual people. He heals communities. Mm. He heals... um, the whole system, a uh, network of people mm-hmm. that that are there, which is why people are left in awe. Mm-hmm. And then the question again goes back to because we said that the, throughout the 
the book of Mark is an invitation to the readers. The question is, so how do we take that? As the readers, as those who have now committed to follow, follow Jesus, what does that mean for us? Yeah, that's the question. Mm -hmm. That's Because the personal aspect of sharing the message the kingdom of God is near, mm -hmm. that's easy. Like I can, you can go and you can knock on someone's door and say, "Hey, have you heard the good news?" Or like our friends in um, in other denominations say, "Hey, have you been saved? Or have you found Jesus?" Uh, and that's great. I think that's helpful. I think that's beneficial. I think we should do that. It, but when we tr when we, it seems like Mark is calling us to transfer that personal faith into public into public spaces, mm -hmm. and that's when it gets tricky. Because let's face it. None of us is comfortable. I, I don't know any of us, and I'm uh, we're pastors, so we we work in in a place where faith kind of comes uh, with the job. But even in church, mm -hmm. the the to question and critique a system or or a space, an environment, mm -hmm. an ecosystem, that's much more challenging. And then to transform an ecosystem. That's much more challenging. Mm. But if we if we take Jesus at his word and we say, hey, um, the invitation is for you to enter with this message of the kingdom of God is at hand into the public arena. Um, I, th I think the church, I think as uh, followers of Jesus, we that's I think where we have we have a little bit of work to do. Yeah. And one of the challenging parts of this is that a lot of times what's amazing about Jesus is that he entered, like you said, he enters into broken spaces. And instead of becoming broken himself, he makes the space whole. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, he is not contaminated by the space. Mm -hmm. He brings purification to the space, which is described very powerfully in this, the, the very last mm -hmm. pericope, the man with leprosy, right? He heals the man with a touch, which, you know, was was a taboo. You're not supposed to touch an unclean person. You become unclean just by touching them. Jesus doesn't become mm -hmm. unclean. He makes the man clean, right? And it's it's just a powerful illustration of what Jesus does, not just here, but in all the spaces that he interacts mm -hmm. with. And so then the question for us is, if that is what we are to do, we're to walk into unclean spaces and make them clean, or we're to walk into broken systems and make help them make them whole, how can we, how can we do that? How can we be in such a, how can we become people who are like Jesus, who can walk into broken spaces and instead of becoming broken, because that's often what happens, we enter into broken systems and the system changes us mm -hmm. to become like it rather than us changing the system to become like Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. How do we walk into these spaces and make them whole instead of becoming like the spaces mm -hmm. that we've walked into? That's a really good question. Um, I think you have to first and foremost be self-differentiated. Mm -hmm. um, there was not one uh, account in Mark's gospel where Jesus didn't, we might know not know fully who Jesus is. Mark might not know who fully who Jesus is, but I guarantee you, Jesus knew who Jesus was. Yeah, and so he had that 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 capacity to to remain self differentiated. The second thing I think is we need to be selective, mm. and what I mean by that is not only do you require a the capacity for self differentiation, but you also require the the need or the intelligence to be selective. Mm. Jesus doesn't destroy the synagogue. Mm. People keep fishing afterwards. Mm. Uh, the disciples are going to go back to fishing. So it's not like Jesus destroys the whole system. He simply tweaks it. He's mm. very selective of the things he's going to choose. Uh, and that I think uh, you mentioned uh, the passage of the leprosy and the healing of the leprosy. Mm. That is crystal clear there. Mm. Jesus says, be clean, touches them. He's clean. And then he gives a really interesting and strange command. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Mm. And uh, the uh, Levitical law demands that if uh, somebody uh, with leprosy would have been healed, there had to be an offering paid. And yet and Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priests and uh, offer the sacrifices that, Mo that Moses commanded. Jesus is the end of the sacrificial mm. system. And yet 
he's very selective about the the way in which he's going to transform that space. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think a lot of us when when we're younger um we we see this Jesus, this man mm-hmm. of action, this uh uncompromising revolutionary and we think that's our job. Mm-hmm. And so we walk into these spaces like bulls in china shops <laughs> and we destroy uh these spaces much to our own detriment mm-hmm. it seems to me like jesus is a self-differentiated jesus knows who he is mm. uh, that's the first invitation for us know who you are in christ and i think once you have that security then you're going to be much more selective in the ways and particularly in the things about the systems that may tweak you yeah that's so powerful. Yeah, it's true. I mean, in this passage, you see Jesus being selective, mm-hmm. right? That the disciples, they're like the bulls in the china yeah. shop. They want him to, hey, people are coming. Stay here. Yeah. Keep healing people. Like, And and yet Jesus is, says no. He's like, he understands what his mission is, who he is. Mm-hmm. And he says, no, we're going to move on. We're going to mm-hmm. go somewhere else and minister there. And that is so powerful. And that is linked. I love how that story is linked to Jesus stepping away in verse 35, mm-hmm. right? He Very early in the morning, while it was still jar- dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And it is in response to Jesus leaving to this, retreating to this solitary place to pray, that Simon Peter comes and, and his other companions come and, and says, Jesus, why aren't you back here doing yeah. this thing? And Jesus has absolute clarity. And he says, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm going to go over here and do this. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that that rhythm, we've talked about this before, of engagement and retreat, right, is so crucial to being self-differentiated mm-hmm. like you're talking about. That's where we get confidence of our identity is when we spend that time with God um, on a daily basis mm-hmm. where he affirms, this is who you are. These are the values I've called you to follow. This, this is the mission that I've given you. We get that confidence from those times so that when we walk into broken spaces, we are able to remain mm-hmm. aligned to him. Mm-hmm. And spaces spaces will remain broken. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think, the, the difficulty that we are faced now. Uh, spaces will remain broken. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the gospel, that's Mark leaves us in a broken space, mm-hmm. uh, unsure and uncertain. Spaces will remain broken. And so perhaps the the Jesus in Mark um, allows us to have a little more grace with ourselves. Yeah. Because maybe the job isn't to completely fix the broken space. Mm. Um, maybe the job is to just make it a little better. Mm. And in in that sense, I think I think Jesus follows, um, or I should I should say, um, the Christian, uh, early Christian tradition of engaging in this rhythm that you're mentioning, uh, engagement and retreat, that follows a very marked Jesus mm. um, in the sense that for Jesus, the the preaching of this message on a macro scale isn't what's as important as is doing the next right thing. Mm. Uh, and so sometimes I think that, as we were reminded uh, beautifully by our colleague Chris Stanley uh, last week, mm-hmm. that perhaps is the best thing that we can do uh, if we believe we're living in an age where the kingdom of heaven is near. Then let's just focus, maybe not on fixing the whole church mm-hmm. or the government or the country mm-hmm. or the economy. Maybe the invitation is to be a bit humbler and to just do the next right thing. Yeah. What is God doing in this space mm. at this time? And how do I join yeah. him in that work? Yeah. It's good to have you back, Joey. It's great to be back. Pray for us. Oh, Lord, we want to thank you so much for being a God of wholeness and healing. That you step into spaces and make them whole. You've stepped into our lives. The reason why we follow you is because you have brought that healing to each of us. And so we ask that you help us to also partner with you in small ways or big, partner with you in making those spaces whole around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So make 
whatever space you are in now a bit better. Do the next right thing. Until we see you next time, have a blessed, blessed rest of the Sabbath. Thank you.